Um, ooh. Good, good, good evening. Good evening, everyone, um, both here and if you are watching us online. Uh, my name is Denis Stolyarov. I'm an assistant curator here at Pushkin House. Um, thank you, Bridget and Natalia, for being here. Um, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, I saw this book uh, a while ago when it was out, and I thought how brilliant it was. And um, Bridget is based in the US, um, and we couldn't afford bringing her over ourselves. So uh, I emailed Bridget and said, please, please, please let us know if you ever happen to be, you know, in London on our own. And I'm really happy that Bridget has obliged and did email me and we have a chance to meet her in person and to hear discuss uh, the book with Natalia. Uh, so I'm just going to read a little bit, um, uh, you know, of the credentials. So Bridget is a professor of history at Brooklyn College of the City University of New York. Uh, and uh, previous um, books, uh, uh, one of them we have downstairs, and it is a quirky title, uh, Esperanto and Languages of Internationalism in Revolutionary Russia. Um, so um, it, it, it is, it is um, um, uh, I suppose, less accessible than this one, uh, but nonetheless exciting. Um, so that's why we have much more copies of, of uh, the multi-ethnic um, Soviet Union. Um, and I just wanted to mentioned that this is an, a book in, in a new series by Bloomsbury Academic called Russia Shorts, and it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, you know, it, it um, covers uh, various topics, uh, starting from, um, um, you know, a post-Soviet man uh, written by Gulnastra Fudinova uh, to, you know, the history of meme culture in Russia, or, you know, Pussy Riot and Punk Aesthetics, or Racism in Russia, I and mean, so many titles, so gorgeous, I really love the whole series. Anyway, um, so, and then uh, we wanted to invite uh, somebody to discuss um, the topic with Bridget, uh, who is much more experienced than we are, and um, I, I, you know, discovered uh, Natalia, and Natalia is a great specialist in Belarusian history, and um, she is a lecturer in modern European history at Queen Mary University, of London. Uh, so, um, uh, apart from Belarusian history, and Natalia works with Soviet nationalities, politics, material culture, and everyday life during late socialism. And um, uh, so now Natalia is writing a history of late Soviet Belarus under the leadership of Peter <laughs> Masharal. When it is out? Okay, uh, I hope I. I I hope, I hope uh, we'll have the honor to have another event about um, your book as well soon. So um, thank you for coming and please join me in welcoming Bridget and Natalia. Well, well I guess it's my turn now. Um, hello everyone, thank you so much for coming uh, or joining us online. Um, and, and of course, thank you so much to Bridget um, for, for writing this terrific book um, and, and for the to Pushkin House for hosting us, Denise Dispit, um, for, for hosting this event, which I think is really important because this book is really important. It's a wonderful book. Um, I'll come clean. I loved it. Um, because I think uh, th there are several reasons why I thought it was terrific, but one of them is because it brings home with wonderful clarity and really beautiful clarity the complexity and messiness sometimes of Soviet nationality politics, um, of, of people's responses to these policies and these politics. Um, and it does so really, really elegantly and, and uh, a, a, as such does a great service, I think, both to um, other scholars um, and also to the much, much wider audience, uh, which is, is the precious thing about this book. Um, and it is an important book and it is important to do this um, now especially, um, because even, um, even though a lot of brilliant work and scholarship has been done on various aspects of Soviet nationality policy, on various aspects of the Soviet Union as an empire, multi-ethnic, um, multicultural, multi-religious empire, um, or different groups within that empire. Um, but nevertheless, um, this book really does um, uh, build on that 
wonderful scholarship wonderfully and brings it to a much wider audience than some, some of us can hope to achieve. Um, and, and that includes your own scholarship as well. Um, you know, your work on, on the Soviet gypsies um, is, is part of that, which is really, um, really terrific work. So um, this is important, I think, because today, even after all of those valiant efforts of other colleagues and ourselves, um, there's still a prevailing image of, of the Soviet Union as some kind of monolith, um, as something very homogeneous, uh, or sometimes at best, uh, kind of in the best case scenario, as something that merely oppressed uh, different nationalities and did nothing else uh, to them. And that, I think, leaves a lot of the story unexplained. It leaves a lot of the complexities about how the Soviet Union worked, how it functioned, how it you know, lasted for this long, um, unaccounted for. And that's what I think this book does quite beautifully. Um, it does begin to explain um, and, and makes it very clear um, what else was there, what, what, what else was there beyond just the, the oppressiveness or, um, or the front of, of sameness. Um, and you argue really persuasively, I thought, in the book that um, it was a lot more than just um, oppression, that the Soviet Union not just tolerated but also encouraged, um, uh, uh, reminded its citizens constantly that they had a nationality, that they were not all just Soviet, but they were Soviet Ukrainians, they were Soviet Kazakhs, they were Soviet Chukchi, um, and, and sometimes created these ethnic groups from, <laughs> from scratch, or the sense of identity, the sense of them belonging to a particular ethnic group. So um, without further ado, could you perhaps tell us, please, um, how and why, as you argue in the book, um, the ethnicity, or the, the concept of ethnicity proved central to um, the Soviet citizens' experience of life and death in, in 20th century. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalia. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Um, Natalia very efficiently articulated my core argument and my core purpose in this book, right, which was to insist and to emphasize, but also to help explain how it was that ethnicity and ethnic politics were absolutely central to Soviet life, right? For an ordinary person, um, you could not escape ultimately having to identify as belonging to um, at least, well, you really only could choose one ultimately, one um, state recognized, quote unquote, official nationality. Nationality kind of functioned in Soviet parlance as it does in English ethnicity. Um, this wasn't like an abstract line written into Soviet citizens' passports. It could mean so many different things in any different Soviet citizen's life. It could mean opportunity and a kind of skyrocketing, accelerated path to Soviet success for one Soviet citizen who kind of was on an advantageous end of the way that a Soviet ethnic politics were working in any given decade. Or it could doom a Soviet citizen to ethnic cleansing, deportation, or in the worst case scenario, right, to death, right, in terms of certain um, ethnic groups that at various times throughout Soviet history were castigated and punished and dealt with as so-called enemy peoples or enemy nations. Now, in terms of complexity, right, I have to thank you for highlighting that that was one of my, one of my great hopes to try and distill this and to emphasize this in a book that is avowedly intended to be short and accessible. What I also really wanted to demonstrate and to illuminate is that between those two very stark differences and poles, right, like uh, being able to lean into Soviet ethnic top politics and have it to work in your favor, to have it work in terms of your personal advantage or even kind of personal existential meaning, right, and acceleration, or on the alternate end, right, being doomed to ethnic cleansing or maybe even death by virtue of belonging to a group deemed an enemy people. Sometimes both of those stories play out, played out in an individual Soviet citizen's life. Right? The story was never the same. Right? Ethnic politics throughout the whole arc of Soviet history was always a shape-shifting, murky. Uh, there was no one singular or standard way in which the centrality of ethnicity or the way that it was politicized in daily life, in the larger culture, in the larger politics, um, 
There was no guarantee that it was going to work one way or the other. Several of the people that I highlight, actually, I highlighted precisely because in the space of their either long or short Soviet lifespans, they seem to experience right, both of these radical poles along the spectrum of a spectrum of possibility that ethnic politics opened up, right, but from which any Soviet citizen could not escape, right? So what does it mean, right, when I say you couldn't escape having an ethnicity, right, in, 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 tangible, in tangible terms? Um, more than anything, I kind of pride myself on being a social historian, right? The reason why I like history is because I like thinking about how ordinary people lived, right, and experienced the world in, in different ways. And it meant a lot of things, right? Um, once the Soviet Union introduced and mandated an internal passport system starting during the first five-year plan, it meant that bureaucratically your ethnicity was declared and inscribed in this fundamental definitive identity document that you had to uh, show and display and proffer up and all of these kind of endless encounters that Soviet citizens had with the state in their daily lives. Um, if you are connoisseurs of Soviet history, you're probably from, I assume you are, if you're here at this event tonight, or maybe you're just curious, but there's a, an extraordinary historian in our field, Sheila Fitzpatrick, right, who's written this book that probably many of you are familiar with called Everyday Stalinism. And one of her primary arguments is, is that like a defining feature of ordinary life under Stalinism is that you were just constantly running up against the wall of the state. To get a job, you had to proffer your identity documents, to get rations, to get food, to get your kids into school, to get yourself into school, to do all of these things. You had to present yourself in this kind of bureaucratic identity. And that it was the number five line item on the Soviet passport. That line item, that answer, who are you by who are you by nationality, was integral. Um, in the early Soviet period, if you belonged to an ethnic group that the Soviet state had decided was particularly, this was the operative word that the Soviets used. I, throughout the book, use scare quotes, really, <laughs> energetically. But if you were a member of an ethnic group that the Soviet state regarded as miserably and kind of frighteningly backward, that meant you were kind of a liability in the Soviet revolutionary sense, right? You weren't up to snuff, you weren't modern yet, you had a lot to learn. But in terms of ethnic politics and how that could be, could work to your potential advantage as a potential opportunity, it also meant you could say, I so-and-so, a member of a beleaguered, benighted, backward, oppressed minority group, am thereby entitled to um, special aid that the Bolshevik regime is promising to me as a means of my advancement and my civilizational catch-up so that I can merge fully with this new Soviet civilization and become a modern um, woman or, or, or man. So it really was something that decided whether you got preferential um, access to resources or opportunities or the opposite. Um, but it was something that Soviet citizens in the early Soviet period learned very quickly, even in the event, right, as there were some plenty of these people in the early Soviet Union who prior to the introduction of this new revolutionary way of life and the ethnic dimension of it, didn't think of themselves primarily in these ethnicized terms. They learned very quickly on the ground um, inescapably in their daily lives, that they had to start thinking of themselves and asserting themselves, defining themselves, or else, you know, in the worst case scenario, hiding themselves or reinventing themselves in ethnic terms in order to kind of lead lives of, at the very least, kind of minimal disruption or pain and hopefully maximum, you know, success or getting through life as, as smoothly as possible. And these were years when it was difficult to lead a smooth life <laughs> as an ordinary person. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, just to follow up on something that you've said just now, you said you were, you were you know, a social historian, you're interested in people's life stories, and I think this is really what another thing, the second thing that I loved about the book is how it 
is able to balance this um, panoramic view of, of complex and constantly shifting landscape of Soviet ethnicity politics um, with individual life stories, with, with really quite telling detail, um, which, which I found fantastic. And, and the, just the kind of breadth of, of the variety of these details is, is wonderful. And in such a short book, without ever becoming overwhelming. So we get to hear about you know, Chukchis slaughtering their reindeer in response to collectivization, or a Kazakh boy surviving the famine and then writing memoirs about the, the way of life that they lost as a result of Soviet modernity. Uh, we hear a lot about Georgian cuisine, which I found particularly hard because I was hungry. <laughs> uh, it's <laughs> wonderful. Um, uh, or, or we hear something about um, a, um, I don't know, a, 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 you know, a, a Jewish writer. Uh, war writers struggling to, uh, fighting to get the story of the Holocaust in the Soviet Union heard. Um, and, and individuals then, you know, feeling sad about the loss of the Soviet Union as something that was really meaningful and important to their life and, and kind of made their life make sense. So we, we get all these stories, but how did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> how did you manage? And what was your, um, you know, I don't know, gu guiding principle or greatest challenge in doing this? Mm -hmm. and, and was there a particular story that stayed with you? Mm -hmm. So uh, Denise introduced the book series of which the book is part, which I also am partial towards. It's called Russian Shorts. But the idea is to take a big theme or a big topic, something essential or urgent, in the large scope of Russian and Soviet history, and to speak about it in an engaging and accessible way, in a kind of tidy book you could hopefully enjoy in the space of an afternoon, and learn something significantly from. Now, this, uh, as Denise also gave a kind of nod to, is very different from the type of books that we normally are contracted to write or that we need to write in order to be promoted in our jobs and all of these things. Um, but the scale and the scope was probably the both um, the greatest challenge, but also the greatest source of writer's liberation for me. I feel like the, the writing this type of book was an absolute joy. I would be excited to write another one of them again, primarily because, because this book was designed to speak about something that I'm passionate about, that I want people to understand, and I could just speak to them directly without going through all these scholarly conventions and the intricacies of historiographical debates, I could just plunge to the heart of the matter. And the other, um, the other opportunity was right to craft this in precisely the way that I myself would think would be the most meaningful read. So I knew from the start, I'm gonna have to find some way, it's a delicate dance, but I ultimately describe the approach I take in the book as inviting the reader to come with me as we appropriately, right, zoom out and talk about the kind of large um, phenomena, events, major moments that you kind of need in, in terms of context to understand uh, the evolution of Soviet history. But while we move through those macro to then zoom in into these the micro of ordinary people's life stories, or little snippets of their lives that somehow kind of evoke or illustrate in a kind of dramatic or real world or a way that kind of marshals a reader's empathy, right, and brings it home. Like, what did this actually mean? Now, I am, I am a social historian. I do think it's important that we know what the Politburo was and how it functioned, but fundamentally, fun fundamentally that's not where my interests are, and for me, that's not really what makes history so urgent and so valuable, right? I think when you can really relate to human beings in the past and register and recognize them as human beings, just like yourself, and to try to the best as your possibility, uh, to the best you can, to try and put yourself into their shoes so that you could understand what it was like to live through this, that that's where history has its greatest potential kind of for meeting, but also for insight. So, <clears throat> Um, ultimately, I don't know if there was a singular guiding principle to how I chose who got, got the spotlight as an individual life story, but um, as you acknowledge, and as that I tried to acknowledge in the book myself, I was able to write this book because so many of our colleagues over the last 30 years have, write these, have written these like extraordinarily erudite, specialized 
um, historical accounts of all these different ethnic groups who experienced the Soviet Union differently. And so I learned from them in all kinds of ways, but I was also able, to, when I was reading those works, to find the stories that most moved me or that most illustrated something for me, and so I was able to kind of pick and choose from them. Some of them came from my own research or just from my, from my own um, writing, and so if I were to, it's hard to choose like amongst the people who get a spotlight who I, I would think is most compelling, but there are a few. And one is someone that I researched myself. So my first book was about Roma. Um, in the Soviet Union, they were, the ethno, ethno, ethnonym that was operational was gypsies, right? Today, it's not um, so much an operational word in, in ordinary conversation. But um, one of the figures I studied and whom I came to know in that way that we come to know our historical subjects in this very mediated archival way is a story of a Romani writer who at the time of the revolution was just coming of age. And his name at the time was Alexander German. And at the time of the revolution, he was kind of like a lot of young people, not all young people, but like a certain amount of young people across revolutionary Russia, kind of excited about the possibility, right? This is a new world we're building and maybe there's an opportunity for me to kind of hitch myself and help build this new world and achieve my other dreams while helping to achieve this larger revolutionary dream of socialism. And his particular dream was that he wanted to become a famous writer. He wanted to write novels and short stories and poetry that would last through the ages. And the first eight years of his life in revolutionary Russia were much like most people who want to become a famous writer <laughs> might his lives, right? So in the early 1920s, he just had doors slammed in his faces. Who are you? You're nobody to us, you know, all of these things. He was getting nowhere. Um, but in a later account that he wrote of his life, he said that there was this pivotal moment that came in 1926 where someone said to him, you know, Alexander, you're a gypsy, right? Those were the words that were, were used. And he said, well, yes, I mean, it's not the most important thing about me. I'm a writer, first and foremost. But his comrade essentially said, there was a new organization just up the street, the All-Russian Gypsy Union. I suggest you go there because things are happening for people like you. By which he meant, right, for people who are members of these ethnic groups that have been, right, deemed and decreed as backward, insufficient, but therefore deserving of special state aid to help you on your accelerated path to Soviet modernity. So he followed that advice. And he opened that door and saw the world of opportunity that was available in the terms of the Bolsheviks' ethnic politics. And it opened up previously where doors had been shoved in his face, right? Now they were opened. Oh, we need writers who represent the non-Russian peoples. We need to publish, right, the poetry or the short stories of um, forgotten, maligned, or never featured voices before. So the early 1930s, for him, precisely, almost as soon as he embraced this new fashion Soviet identity as a Soviet gypsy writer, his career just kind of went up, 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 up. He wrote the first plays for the Soviet Union's gypsy theater. He got um, a membership card to the Union of Soviet Writers, which was no small thing. It's a very illustrious, prestigious thing. He was making it in life, right? What's kind of the key, right? And some levels for me, this story in and of itself, to the extent that I've told you to so far, is not exceptional, right? These types of things played out over and over and over in terms of people learning to move and maneuver and to take advantage of these early Soviet ethnic politics. The thing about Alexander Germano's life that I found so interesting was, is that after the war, when he was headed into retirement and he had to fill out his identity papers and write the story of his Soviet life, he changed his story again 
And to the answer to the question in 1953, who are you by nationality, Alexander Germano, who had just spent the last 20 years, it's kind of ironic to use this verb, capitalizing <laughs> in, in a social estate, but capitalizing on his ethnicity, switched tactics again, right? And what he was signaling was the same savvy awareness of Soviet ethnic politics that he had demonstrated time and time again throughout the 1930s and the 1940s. He had internalized and felt and realized the shift that had taken place during World War II in particular, whereby Russianness became unapologetically elevated as the first, most vaunted, most celebrated ethnic group in the Soviet Union. And he had seen, while Russianness was on the ascent during these years, his own political currency, his own writer's currency as a member of a quote unquote backward ethnic group move on the decline. And so he kind of engaged in this savvy ethnic politicking in a, in a startling way towards the end of his life too. I think his life is both ordinary and representative of how Soviet people of all different types of ethnicities learned that there was a politics and that you could maneuver in it. But I think it's also extraordinary and singular to the extent that I was able to find in the archives that very savvy and almost like textbook chronological move, right? That shift to kind of merge with the times and to lean into the prevailing Russocentrism of the early post-war period. Yeah. Thank you very much, that, that's fantastic. And I, I mean, the real strength of the book, I think, is how it also shows and uh, demonstrates, uh, really, how not just kind of these policies from top down, you know, dictated and governing people's lives, um, but also people responding subverting, using, abusing these policies to suit their purposes, their sense of what's right, what's wrong, their, their identity, their dreams. Um, and I think sometimes it gets forgotten when we talk about the Soviet Union, that people actually did not just passively receive what was sent their way, but they did something with it, worked with it, and sometimes quite cleverly. Um, but they also made me think of a couple of other questions, <laughs> if, if I may. Um, one, one is, so, you know, this example really shows how some people could really benefit, with a bit of savviness, a good deal of luck, uh, could benefit from these nationality politics. Uh, and also it shows that the nationality politics itself shifted and changed over time, right? So not, it, they were not particularly, there was never one policy, I think right. you say, you, you made that very clear in the book, um, but never, did this mess <laughs> remain static, if that makes sense? Um, so how did this shift and ebb and flow and change and how did people adapt to it and who, who really kind of cashed in? Was there a pattern to this? Yeah, well, you know, there is a lot of luck. There, timing is everything for a Soviet person as for anyone else, I, th I think so many of these things. And sometimes people were just timing-wise out of luck in terms of how larger geopolitical concerns, larger domestic political concerns could lead the Stalinist state or the later Soviet state to make these subtle shifts and these changes in terms of Soviet nationality policy. Now, if you listen to like my example of Germano in the 20s and 30s, it, all, it might kind of lend itself to a story of like, this is a time of great, a cornucopia of opportunities if you are a quote unquote backward nationality, right? Like the world is your Soviet oyster, all of these things. But it, it's, it, was, it was messy even in the 1930s. The Soviet Union in the 1930s um, had a lot of reasons to be very fearful of the outside world and had a lot of good reasons actually to be fearful of Hitler's Germany in particular. And under Stalin, as is well known, right, there was a great deal of paranoia, there was a great deal of outsized fear, and this um, ultimately gives rise on the eve of World War II to this famous and very grim period of the purges and the terror, right, in which, um, Hundreds of thousands of innocent Soviet people are arrested and charged with Trotskyite espionage and all of these things. 
What sometimes gets lost from that larger story, which is generally well known, is that there were also ethnic dimensions to the terror and the purges as well, right? As Stalin is indulging these kind of metastasizing fears he has about external enemies, he's worrying about slippage across Soviet borders, and he starts to fixate and to focus on the possibility that non-Russian peoples across all of the Soviet Union's many borders are slipping and sliding and engaging right in these counter-revolutionary, counti-Soviet activities with the Soviet Union's enemies abroad, right? And he, he comes up with this whole logic, right, of a fifth, fifth columns are everywhere afoot. And this is where you see the first kind of big era or big push of Soviet ethnic cleansing in which different groups that are associated with external states are rounded up, deported to Central Asia or to Siberia, et cetera, in a kind of Stalinist attempt to immunize a perceived ethnic threat. But this is not an isolated, isolated story that can only be contained to the, the context of the purges and the terror. During World War II, when the Soviet Union is desperately trying to survive, right, this apocalyptic invasion, those fears remain and they grow. And while kind of trying to survive against this onslaught, the Soviet Union and, and invests precious resources, again, in these concentrated ethnic cleansing campaigns. And here you see, too, a lot of the messiness, the ambivalence, the ironies of some of these things. Now, one of the groups that was targeted during the war for ethnic cleansing, very famously, are the Chechens. Almost en masse, right, the entire Chechen population of the Caucasus is rounded up, put onto cattle cars, and deported to Central Asia on the, on the kind of Stalinist logic that they're just waiting to help the, the Soviet Union's enemies. When the Chechens get to Central Asia, those who are fortunate enough to survive this terrible <laughs> operation, you have Soviet bureaucrats writing back to their colleagues in the Caucasus and saying, hey, do you still have some of that um, nationalities literature that we produced for the Chechens in the 20s and 30s? Because they're gonna need it here, right? The idea was, right, to take the Chechens from their homeland, to deport them, to immunize, right, to stabilize their perceived status as a threatening enemy people. But in their new location as deportees, there was still the Soviet state's impulse to insist on their ethnic affiliation and to think about themselves, to study themselves, to learn, to produce Chechen literature and all of these things. So uh, this is a, I, I, you know, I kind of focused in on ethnic cleansing as a, because I think it's good to balance some of these things out. But, but the shifts in Soviet nationality policy that came across time, it almost works like, you know, an ocean wave. I think of World War II and the purges and the terror on the eve of it as a kind of big, violent wave that crashed and produced these ethnic dimensions of violence and ethnic cleansing. But there are subtler shifts as well, and there are also shifts that take place that also people can try to make an opportunity of as well, right? In, in the case of, in the post-war period, some people trying to reimagine themselves as Russians because Russians Russianness was the preferred ethnicity. Um, another one that we didn't talk about but that does carry through in the, in the text as a whole is the significance of Jewish life in the Soviet Union, right? In the 20s and 30s, if you're a young Jew in the Soviet Union, right, you think like, this is maybe the best moment in history to be a Jew in this territory, right? And not for, not for nothing. And you have 300,000 Jews who previously had been confined to the shtetls, right? Like moving to the cities, going to university, all of these things. But there's a huge shift that starts to take place already during wartime and that just worsens so precipitously in the post-war period of state-sponsored Soviet anti-Semitism. Where, whereby in the 20s and 30, 30s, a uh, kind of standard Soviet Jewish life story was the revolution is opening up all of these opportunities for me. After the war, almost all of those opportunities are not only denied to Jewish people in the Soviet Union, but in, a, in addition to that denial of opportunity, 
there is a state tolerated, tacitly endorsed popular anti-Semitism that is allowed to be given full vent to. Right, um, thank you very much. No, I, I, I thought that was, um, yeah, there was the really important balances um, that, that you've struck with matching the kind of the affirmative action yes. <laughs> with the uh, uh, with the violence and terror and and, and this is almost schizophrenic um, uh, coexistence of, of of rupturing someone's life and someone's traditions and someone's culture uh, with one hand and then promoting it or, or claiming to promote it with another and uh, another example I thought of as I was listening to you was um, uh, the sort of national um, national cultural uh, figures and, and prominent um, activists of the 1920s and early 30s in, um, in a lot of these ethnic republics, especially Ukraine and, and Belarus, who um, took very earnestly on board this message of the Soviet regime that this is going to be a different kind of federation, that they're going to be promoted, that they will have space for their national culture, for their national language, all these things will be taught in schools, and new museums will be opened up, their histories will be kind of put forward um, as, as legitimate, important part of the fabric of Soviet life. And then these very people who took this earnestly, or thought they could forge careers, yeah. as, you, as you say in your book, out of this, um, and, and embraced this sort of um, uh, national in, in form, socialist in content principle that you, you talk about. Um, then they were um, the first ones to go in the terror, in the purges, because they were suddenly branded as bu nationalist bourgeoisie or bourgeois nationalists, rather, um, and seen as the fifth column or potentially uh, enemies of the state saboteurs and, and so on, and were rounded up. A lot of them were executed, um, some died in prison. And, and that in itself dealt a huge blow to the very efforts that the Soviet state sponsored just previously of building up cultural institutions, building up scientific institutions, schools and so on in those very republics. So this kind of shifting back and forth between extreme, you know, almost aggressive nation building, I quite like that yeah. phrase that you used, and aggressive, you know, violence. Um, uh, there isn't any other kind of violence, but just violence um, uh, is quite staggering. In, in the so I mean, it's sort of, I guess it... Um, diminishes, I suppose, after 1953 in some, ex in some ways. Um, there isn't another mass terror or deportations, but even then the reverberations of this mm -hmm. carry on. You know, the um, Tatars are not allowed to come back yes. for, for until the end of the Soviet Union. Um, Anti-Semitism, as you see, prevails um, because the floodgates had been opened in the 1950s. Mm. Um, so so it, it, it makes for a very a strange pattern and, and even more extraordinary how the Soviet people are able to kind of adapt and adjust to it. And, um, and, and you know, another thing that I quite liked is at the end you talk about how the Soviet Union, you know, comes apart and, and you again give a very clear picture of how that happened and the role of the ethnicity and, and ethnic politics that plays into it and, and the sort of um, my, uh, time bombs that were <laughs> laid by this complex Soviet politi politics just start exploding in various parts of the Soviet Union and it kind of crumbles along ethnic lines. But um, at the same time, there are people who mourn its passing um, and to whom it made sense um, and, and their lives made sense and they made the best of it. So um, looking beyond that moment of collapse, um, do you think, and, and particularly in the tragic context of the present day and the events, uh, the war in Ukraine, um, and thinking back to this rather awful um, speech by, by Putin that made a lot of historians cringe um, uh, of, of his own version of Soviet history. Uh, what lessons can we draw uh, from the Soviet experience, from the, this you know, story of, of the Soviet multi-ethnic empire? If any. For sure. So the book does not move much beyond 1991, um, and I, I very upfront up about it in the book. It's in part because the, the the project was so contained, but I also think that it's another book that someone else should write and should urgent er, should urgently write. But I think that um, there are a couple of things 
that I take away, there are a few things that I take away grimly in terms of connecting this book and the history it covers and our contemporary calamities. One is, you mentioned Putin's speech on February 21st of 2022. And it was like a heartbreaking uh, moment to see someone so malign make so real life urgent, something that I had spent as a scholar so much time thinking about, right? Because in that speech that he gave on the eve of his full scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, he hearkened back explicitly and in his own revisionist history, mixing and melding some fact with delusion and his own kind of ultra nationalist revanchist reading of things, he hearkened back explicitly to the uh, Soviet nationality policy as it was created and as I discuss in this book. And in his telling in the speech that was meant to justify uh, this full scale invasion, he says, Lenin betrayed us, right? Lenin messed up, and Lenin artificially created Ukraine, right? Almost out of whole cloth, right? In like Putin's uh, vision during this speech. It's right for the Soviets' own, the Bolsheviks' own cynical interests. They caved and tried to cater to um, nationalist sentiment and nationalist interests, and thereby created Ukraine artificially, robbing us, right? And thereby giving me, Putin, this historic grand mission to put the empire back together again. There are so many things that are wrong with this, right? Now, on the one hand, what's right about it is that Lenin and Stalin in 1917 and 1918 were very aware that there were people within their realm that were motivated by nationalist sentiments and national interests and that they had to kind of do something if they wanted to hold on to as much as they, they had to placate or kind of buy off these constituencies. That part isn't wrong, right? But what is so wrong and what is so offensive is so characteristic of Putin's whole worldview, right? In Putin's world, Putin's worldview, right, people don't make history. Putin's make history, right? Like leaders make history, Lenin's make history, Stalin's make history, and what ordinary people have to do or say or how they live their lives is meaningless. It also, of course, in one like efficient little rhetorical flourish, denies that there was Ukraine prior to 1917, right, and, and tries to obliterate in that way. But again, as a social historian, one of the things that I find so offensive about his whole framing there is that not just past, but also present, and I think this is the big takeaway, who makes a nation, right? Who gets to decide who or what is a nation and how legitimate it is and how urgent it is? the people who belong to that, to that nation, right? And what he can't stand, right, what he can't stomach in this whole terrifying, awful war is all about this kind of inability to reckon with or accept the fact that a whole country of people have made a decision in their daily plebiscite over years, and it's been complicated, it has been a complicated history of its own, but Ukrainian people made a decision to chart a path forward in the aftermath of the Soviet Union's collapse and to move forward in the world and to cement themselves as a nation with their own values. And in recent years, those values are, of course, antithetical to the retrograde uh, types of values that Putin celebrates for his own, for his own Russia. But I think, I think that, you know, it's almost too glib to say, but like, <laughs> As historians, we find it so painful to hear P Putin try to talk about history because he doesn't get it, right? But he's also like so, um, he just will willingly distort things. I also think that he believes a lot of his own distortions, but he doesn't, he doesn't get how history works. And one of the lessons that I think that he misses and that I hope none of us lose sight of, right, as we watch this all, is that it's not up to Putin ultimately, right? It's not up to Putin who, who, gets to, who gets to be Ukrainian. I mean, there is the, there's the whole, there is the, the demise of the Soviet Union that is important here, right? There, it was not preordained that when the Soviet Union, it was not preordained that the Soviet Union would collapse. It was not preordained that when it did collapse, it would collapse in this way. But um, that's what's so fascinating about history, is that 
things happen in unexpected, contingent, unpredictable ways. And really, if you think about modern history, a lot of times the people who make the biggest impact are the people whose names we don't talk about. It's not the Putins. I'm not saying Putin's not important. He obviously is. But it's the millions of people who over the past how many years now have defended against extraordinary odds their right to belong to this new nation state of Ukraine. Now, I said there were a couple of things. I know that I talk <laughs> too much. But the other thing that I do want to say that I have given a lot of thought about, not just as a scholar, but as a human being and as a historian, but also as a teacher, a takeaway is I think that, and here I'm speaking just of a Western perspective, I think 1991 was greeted in the West, not just with like too much smug celebration, but with like too much ready-made relief. Like it's all, it's all decided now, right? Like, ah, uh, the Soviet Union collapsed, nuclear weapons didn't go off, more or less peaceful, relatively bloodless, that's all we said, there was bloodshed, right? Um, but in the West, it was very easy to say, yay, the Cold War is over, it's the end of history in the Fukuyama sense. They'll eventually get to our way of life, which is the right way of life, and this will sort itself out, right? That it, that it was over, that the story of the Soviet Union was over more or less in 1991. For me, 2022, 2023, but also 2014, to me, the lesson is 1991 is not over, right? Like, I also think historians, when they talk about decolonization in the 20th century as this primary movement, this primary force, this overriding concern of the 20th century, in world history terms, rarely is the Soviet Union integrated in this, uh, those discussions and into those concerns, right? Stalin, I mean, not Stalin, Putin, right? <laughs> Putin, Putin, Putin is trying to turn back the tides of what has been an anguished, fraught, and ultimately indeterminate, not just in Ukraine, but process of decolonization throughout the former Soviet empire, right? Another, another example that does get its moment in the book is um, the explosion of ethnic conflict during perestroika in Nagorno-Karabakh, right? And then when I had to, when I was writing the book, I had to say, this is an open story, right? Like, this is not a closed conflict um, decades later. But I think, I think, I think in the West, not just historians, but ordinary people too, we dropped the ball on trying to understand and to pay attention, as we often do, right? But I think that there was so much, the evil empire is over, that it closed our ability to pay attention to the ways in which that empire lives on and on, not just in people's memories and their feeling of ambivalence about the collapse, but also in terms of these rather consequential conflicts that have broken out since. Well, thank you very much. I mean, this was uh, really um, thought-provoking and, and quite a wonderful way to, to bring together the, the answer to my question. And I think it's also a beautiful moment to open our conversation to our audience on, online and, and here. So um, if anyone has a question, um, stick your hand up and I think Denise will hand you over the mic. We, we need the mic to be heard on, online. So um, just wait a little bit for him to jump up to you. So anyone? to a lecture about uh, atom nuclear testing mm -hmm. in Kazakhstan. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the presenter said is that she said, why did they choose Kazakhstan? And was it that they considered the people lesser, less people than the others? And that's something that stuck with me. And that, um, so today when I was... Um, looking at the content of what you were presenting, I was wondering if that's you thinking as well or what you kind of figured out that um, 
you know, all nations are equal or all ethnicities within the Soviet Union are equal, but some are more, more equal, equal than, than others. <laughs> and, you know, nuclear testing in Kazakhstan is okay because they are less or people or something like that. Mm -hmm. So This is a great question, and it actually gets to something that I don't think we covered in, uh, in our exchange, so I thank you for asking it. Um, there was like a core Soviet principle that all of the peoples of the Soviet Union were equal, right? When, when you've got the creation of socialism and the achievement of socialism, the Soviet people, it is declared in the mid-1930s, have, have achieved a new landmark moment in history. Stalin called it the friendship of peoples. This metaphor that becomes operational for the remainder of the Soviet uh, period allowed the Soviet state to do two things at one time, right? On the one, and, it, it, and it's precisely what you're talking about. It allowed them to say out of one side of their mouth, we're a family, not just a friendship of peoples, but it was also about fraternity, right? We're brother republics, we're all knitted together, we live in harmony, we respect one another's differences while also delighting in our shared socialist civilization. But we've achieved something truly special and progressive in human history in that we have not obliterated ethnic difference but celebrated and created a people in harmony um, cele able to celebrate those differences. In the same breath, right, in the same speech, this is where Stalin publicly introduces the notion of the Russian people as the bravest, the boldest, the smartest, the most leading, right? Mm -hmm. The most number one brother of all the brothers of the Soviet people. So they try to ideologically, right, and politically claim both of these things at the same time, right? And they did for the remainder of the Soviet period. In actuality, right, there are so many ways in which you can see structurally on the ground in ordinary people's lives but also in the different republic, uh, Republican realities, how there is a hierarchy. Mm -hmm. There was a clear ethnic hierarchy. The Central Asian republics, right, during perestroika, one of the first things that they, uh, Central Asian people start clamoring about publicly right, when they're finally given vent to kind of say things openly and loudly for the first time is they say, why do we get the smallest amount of the budget, mm. right? Why are our child, uh, you know, our infant mortality rates higher than they are in Russia, et cetera, et cetera, right? <laughs> now, Gorbachev did not have um, ready-made answers for these things because the ready-made answer was clear for everyone who was concerned, right? Central Asian republics were not seen to be on the same priority level as the Russian people. The Russian language was prioritized in the way that minority languages were never prioritized, mm. right? There's a whole kind of, there's a whole kind of element of historical scholarship that I look forward to that really looks even at just the language politics, right? It's yeah. one thing to say, in the Soviet Union, all these, these different languages flourish, right? But mm. <laughs> ethnic mm. Russians never had to learn any of those minority languages. Right, but the people, uh, Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, Tajik, right, they had to mm. learn Russian in order to, to make do in these in these terms, right? So, Kazakhstan is not my area of expertise, but I like that that's the kind of pretext for your question because it comes up in another way that we were talking about these shifts and dynamics in Soviet policies and how you can think of opportunity and violence in terms of both ends of this aggressive <coughs> nation building in the Soviet Union. Yeah. Kazakhstan sticks out in my imagination and my historical understanding of these dynamics in a particularly vivid way because during collectivization, Kazakhstan suffered enormously as a result of those policies in the terms of the Kazakh famine, right? 40% of the Kazakh population will die agonizing deaths of starvation wrought by Stalinist collectivization policies. And no sooner has like the people who survive the famine kind of get back on their feet and start building their Soviet lives as is mandated, but the Soviet state, when it 
begins those ethnic cleansing operations in the 1930s that I referenced earlier, one of the main drop-off points for Poles, for Finns, for Tatars, for all these various groups that are deemed enemy nations is Kazakhstan. They get dropped off and also told to help rebuild and to um, make anew this, this, this Soviet Kazakhstan. Um, but I guess the, I, I don't know if there's a short answer to your question. I don't know if I'm capable of a short answer to any question. But, <laughs> but the short answer to your question is that you're exactly right. Like this was, was this was the this is the kind of fundamental claiming two things at the same time that are in fundamental tension that the Soviet state very openly claimed. Right? We're all equal. This is what makes the Soviet Union so great. But don't ever forget that the Russians are the first among equals. They're the bravest people, they're our greatest our people, they're, they're our culture-bearing mm. people are leading. Yeah. Thank My you My favorite much. little vignette of getting back at that <laughs> centrality of Russian in the hierarchy of the Soviet Union is when you talk about the Tajik man, a Tajik man going to Lithuania and trying to order a coffee in a cafe and the Lithuanian waitress refuses to serve him until the moment that he addresses her in Tajik. Then suddenly he's okay um, and she serves him coffee um, and they then communicate in Russian as the only shared language they have in yeah. common. But he had to kind of declare his non-Russian credentials and kind of say, let's drop this dominance of the Russian um, nationality out of the equation and talk like fraternal nations. It was like a, in perestroika is when this example comes out, like a kind of recognition of colonized solidarity, right? Like she refuses to serve him coffee when he orders it in Russian, right? Which is the universal language of the Soviet empire. But if, if you are um, a native Latvian, right? Russia, Russian is the language of imperial domination and it's perestroika and things are out for the open. But as soon as he ordered coffee in his native language of Tajik, which she couldn't understand, it was a different type of brotherhood, a different type of solidarity, a solidarity of, of, of being colonized peoples in the Soviet state. I, th I think there's a work to be done on the connections. We, we tend to think of the relationship between the nationalities and Russian center nationalities in Moscow. I think there's work to be done looking at relationships between different non-Russian nationalities in the Soviet Union and how they relate to each other and kind of, um, what emerged out of that. Because that also has um, you know, some echoes and consequences for how those now independent nations work with each other yes. now, yes. Um, you know, as, 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 as countries rather than as republics of mm -hmm. in one federation. So I will that space. <laughs> I, <laughs> I will take the opportunity to also celebrate another book by one of our colleagues whose work inspired some of this, but it, it's really pioneering work. I think that the book, even though it's a work of like, academic scholarship is still pretty accessible, but it's by a scholar named Krista Goff, who's extraordinary and who does all these amazing oral histories. But her book is called Nested Nationalism. I, I borrowed from like its greatest, its greatest hits. But what is so interesting about Krista Goff's work is that she looked at the different ways you could experience ethnicity within a non-Russian republic. So she chose as her kind of case study Azerbaijan Right? And she looked actually at how non-Azeris within Soviet Azerbaijan were also kind of silenced and erased and kind of obliterated and assimilated in a way that kind of, like there were layers of, there are layers of hierarchy also within the Soviet Union as it played out. I mean, we kind of imagine that the nationalities, non-Russian nationalities were good guys yeah. and, and the Russians <laughs> were the bad guys. But actually, they could be quite nasty to yeah. their autonomous regional yes. nationalities and so on, yeah. as in the case of Thomas. Um, I have a question. Um, so uh, you were talking, um, sorry, I just my, my dramatic entrance. Uh, you were talking about the shifting uh, policies of the Soviet Union. Um, I'm wondering to what extent these uh, shifts uh, could have been, con uh, not could, but have been conditioned by the changing nationalist attitudes uh, 
national and uh, ethnical attitudes in the rest of the world and primarily in the Western world. And I'm thinking, you know, the, the most basic example was the anti-Semitism, which was, you know, um, rampant in the 1930s and uh, the Soviet Union was like, you know, the, uh, the, the beacon of, uh, you know, internationalism, while then, you know, it was rebranded as cosmopolitanism and, 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 you know, suppressed and, and like then in the 50s, the Soviet Union was like as anti-Semitic as, you know, the next of it. So uh, what was the connection between, you know, the global picture and the local Soviet shifts? I love this question. I love this question not only as a writer, I love this question primarily as, a, as someone who tries to teach university courses that deliver some level of nuance to an educated population, right? I think that one of the mistakes that actually our field made for a very long time was to think about the Soviet Union in isolation, right? And to not think of it as part of a larger world. Right? I mean, it was an, an endeavor to refashion life on Earth, so we should have been thinking about it in its global context in general. But I think that the, to, to kind of imagine that uh, Soviet ethnic politics were decided first and foremost by domestic concerns is a major mistake, because so, at so many points, I think that the larger geopolitical concerns are actually moving the regime to make certain types of shifts or decisions that they made. There's the one that I mentioned earlier, but you, you bring up another excellent case in point, right? Uh, in the 1930s, the Soviet Union could say, right, nowhere in the world do uh, Jews live as freely as they do here. We created even their, uh, a Jewish autonomous region, a Soviet Zion, for example. One of the ironies being the Soviet Union is one of the first states to recognize the state of Israel, but it, instantly sets off, right, the, the paranoid hackles of the, of the Stalinist state. And almost immediately on the editorial page of Pravda is there this kind of forceful claim. In the Soviet Union, we have no need of Israel, right, because the Jewish people's problems are solved. But at the same time, right, they become so obsessively fixated on the idea that Jews' loyalties are now focused outside of the Soviet Union, that it helps to justify, right, in this terms of kind of Stalinist calculus of persecuting different ethnic groups, it justifies this anti-cosmopolitan campaign in which Jewish intellectuals, playwrights, artists, all kinds of figures are arrested. One of the most famous kind of moments in the anti-cosmopolitan campaign, and, it, and it, I do write about it, is that um, a high-ranking Communist Party member, the wife of Vyacheslav Molotov, is essentially arrested and accused of bourgeois nationalism and Israel uh, sympathies and sent off to the gulag until, until, after, until after Stalin dies and she's brought back. But um, I think that I think that these larger global concerns played heavy on how the Soviet Union directed its policies against its differentiated population, but also played heavy in terms of how the Soviet Union tried to narrate its story of progressive inter-ethnic harmony on the world stage. In the Cold War period, right, there's a huge kind of global frame, right? The Soviet Union will say, very forcefully. Look at the United States. Look at how black people suffer in the United States. They weren't wrong, right? But they, but they tried to make the argument. Here in the Soviet Union, there are no peoples who are treated this way. And we have achieved tolerance. We have achieved ethnic harmony. And I think another way in which the Cold War is kind of integral to thinking about the shift in how the Soviet Union explained itself as this paragon of enlightened humanity, was against the backdrop of decolonization. They would invite emissaries, people's representatives from the decolonizing world to come travel the Soviet Union and go to like showcase cities in Central Asia and say, look at the finest of modernity that you can have on offer if you kind of ally yourself with Soviet superpower and Soviet technology and all of these things. So they were able to use even their kind of Republican level um, nation building as a way to kind of curry favor with decolonizing peoples in the Cold War. <laughs>
So you mentioned there the concept of bourgeois nation nationalism, and I think a key tension in kind of Soviet nationality policy is this tension between celebrating nationality on the one hand and then clamping down on any signs of nationalism, which is just this kind of paradox or this balancing act that plays out. I was wondering, kind of, do you discuss it in the book or what's your own approach? Because I think even within scholarship, it becomes this really kind of tense thing that people really struggle to kind of get their heads around because it was so paradoxical. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you phrase it perfectly in terms of tension. I, I write about it as an ideological tightrope, mm. right? And if you were someone who was prominently engaged in Soviet nation building, you were always like an acrobat on a tightrope and it's like, which way are the political winds shifting today? And Natalia, you mentioned it earlier, some of, some of the people that I write about who kind of, you know, in the 20s and early 30s are like so energetic and so earnest, right? Like they really think like this is the best thing, right? Like we can do two great things at the same time. We can build up our, 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 nation, um, our national culture and we can build socialism, right? A, a great new way to organize it and organize life. So, some of the, many of these same people will end up getting arrested during the purges and terror and charged with bourgeois nationalism. They essentially get executed or sent off to the gulag for being what three years previously would have been regarded publicly and celebrated and given awards for as like good Soviet citizenship. And it is one of the great, um, the great tragedies of, of the book, right, um, is that I think this is actually why I, I tried to find stories of people whose individual life kind of encapsulated that whole spectrum of possibility. Because it did play out in, in these people's lives so frequently in this way, right? The Jadids in Central Asia, Ukrainian nation builders in the 20s and 30s, all over the Soviet Union, some of the earliest targets during the purges and terror were people who just years before were getting, you know, prizes and accolades for their meritorious service in building up the downtrodden non-Russian peoples of the Soviet Union. And you, um, we, we spoke before the event started, but you have an interest in the, in the Baltics. Uh, it's another kind of fascinating case in terms of you think of, these are territories that the Soviet Union forcibly annexes during World War II and a lot of times scholars kind of rush to say like, oh, the 20s and the 30s is the real heyday of Soviet nation building. But after the war in the Baltics, a lot of the same dynamics that are first tried out in the 20s and 30s are tried out again or applied to the case of Sovietizing the Baltic states that are um, now being brought in as, whether they like it or not, union republics. People are ethnically cleansed, elites, intellectuals, deported to Kazakhstan <laughs> very often, Russian speakers brought in. So it, it does, it, the story is not just confined to the 20s or 30s also. If I may jump in with a, a little bit of, uh, I was thinking of your analogy of Soviet policies as kind of waves. Mm -hmm. Another way of thinking of it is, or them is a, a, a slight loop, a, a rather vague loop, but um, in the, late 50s and 60s after Stalin's death and then in Khrushchev, in the Khrushchev era especially, there is a bit of a revival of those 1920s, early 30s policies of uh, giving more scope to nationality project building um, and, and giving more, more autonomy, I suppose, to um, local national, national um, decision making, as long as it's confined to within. I mean, certain boundaries must not be crossed, and if you, you're interested in the Baltics, of course, the Latvian purge comes on the heels of the Latvians pushing a bit too far with the uh, keeping the Russian language out of their schools. Um, so that, that triggers a purge, but uh, not, not the only thing that triggers it, but, but certainly one uh, important factor. Uh, but on the whole, there is again a, a this kind of more relaxed climate in which it's possible to, you know, to get things done so people who want to have their national projects can, can do so. There's a bit of a, of a loop um, there. And um, uh, it, the scars of the 1930s, of the terror, of the um, deportations, of, of uh, the wartime deportations as well, don't heal very fast and, and it takes a new generation of, 
cultural agents, cultural, you know, writers, poets, artists, uh, to emerge, to be unscarred by the experience of the terror, to really pick up those, or, or take the state that it's promise uh, that it's not going to go after them, you know, like a ton of bricks. So, so there is a bit of a you can revival, but it is not easy because of the, um, you know, tight roping in the past proved fatal. Um, we have a couple of questions online. So, uh, firstly, some people complain uh, and ask to hold uh, the microphone oh. slightly close. I'm sorry about that. Um, so, and we have a qu um, some comments and questions. Um, so, uh, first of all, just like to say thank you for the book. It really was an incredibly succinct and human summation of the subject. I'm also particularly happy that you focused such attention on the fate of Soviet Jews. Um, and then the question is about uh, segregation and ghettoization. Uh, do you feel that this insight has relevance to today in a period where uh, Western political thought seems once more bound up tightly with the idea of racial or ethnic identity? Oh. Um, I think that this, I think this story, this history has relevance that goes beyond the Soviet past, it has relevance beyond our present in terms of thinking about Ukraine war, decolonization in the Soviet space. I think that um, there are lessons to be learned here in terms of thinking about ethnic identity and its mobilization across time and space, right? One of the dynamics I try to explain in the book is how, you know, one of the ironies of this story is that you know, when the Bolsheviks first kind of inaugurated their nationality policy, their premise was, we'll instrumentalize ethnic politics, right, for the short term, to meet our short term goals and our needs. And when we don't need it anymore, we'll dispense with it, and it won't matter because we'll have reached socialism and all of this, all of this extraneous ethnicity stuff will wither away, right? But the irony is, is that they so embedded it, they so institutionalized it, they so mandated the importance of ethnic identity in people's lives that they essentially mandated the fetishization of ethnic identity, right? They produced, right, the most stereotypical understandings of what it was, ethnic types is a, a phrase that they end up using, right? And so the kind of ironies abound. I mentioned earlier during the Cold War, um, under Khrushchev in particular, right, it's this like chest-thumping pride. The Soviet Union has triumphed over racism. We don't have race here. We don't have racism here. But effectively, what they had operationalized and produced was their own kind of racial dynamics, right? They didn't call it as such, but it worked in its own, own way as such. I think that the lesson there, or maybe the insight or the the way in which this could have wider, uh, provide some kind of wider insight or, or a moment for contemplation is, you know, also the tightrope of, of mobilizing ethnic identity. At what point do we so fetishize, right? Uh, or do we, sh we so ingrain the idea that um, because someone belongs to an ethnic group, they dance one way, they sing one way, they look one way, they sound one way. It became very almost, absurdly oversimplified the Soviet stereotyping of, of ethnic identity in the name of celebration, right? That's the, that's the kind of uh, oddity of, of the dynamic there. I hope I'm speaking better into the microphone now. <laughs> I also got this feeling that the Soviet regime was a bit trapped. <laughs> in the, so no matter what they did to ethnic groups and nationalities, they were promoting them. They were reminding them that when they were oppressing them, as you said with the Chechens, even you know, short of sending them literature that reminded the Chechens that they were Chechens, um, by singling them out and subjecting them to this, you know, de to deportation, to the trauma of it. Um, giving this group of people a collective memory of that trauma, they were creating them as a nation. Yeah. Even if they had done nothing else to, to tell the Chechens that they were Chechens. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and in a way, I, I sometimes think of that in the context of the war in Ukraine. And, and I think, uh, you know, I think the Ukrainians, they didn't need to prove that they were a nation, right. but, but boy, have they done so. Yes. Um, you know, um, and, and, and in, in, in that way, once the Soviets kind of stepped on that path of talking about ethnicity, they were doomed. In the s doomed not in the sense that the Soviet Union would collapse, not necessarily, as you say, this was not preordained. But they were doomed that they would find it very difficult to then disentangle themselves to from walk this. To back, exactly. right? Like, how do you walk, once you make it so yeah. important, or yeah. so central, or so definitive, you can't like, yeah. oh, sorry guys. Forget we, about you know, all that. <laughs> <laughs> it's really not a big deal, let's talk about class. Yeah. And, and they do, do try sometimes, don't they? They say, the Soviet identity is what you really ought to have, and, and, and you know, we're all, Soon the, the languages will disappear, the different cultures will disappear, and they just never do. And at, and at and some they point they question it. They did not let people, remember we started with the discussion of the passports, who are you by nationality, the question number five. In the 50s and 60s, a lot of people came out and they said like, look, I'm a Soviet person, right? Like I am the new Soviet person. I, I, my, my nationality or my ethnicity is almost irrelevant here. Like they wanted to identify as Soviet and they were not allowed. So it wasn't just that they couldn't walk it back, but they themselves had so bought into the logic, right? It became inconceivable, not only for an ordinary person to like live life without ethnicity as this determining feature, this overriding feature, but I think it also became impossible for the guys, and they were mostly guys, at the top to imagine a Soviet Union without the ethnic principle deciding so many things. I think they were sometimes questioned on that uh, by, so for example, I, I've, I've looked at Belarusian writers quite publicly saying, so how do you envisage this merging of the languages? <laughs> for example, uh, would the Belarusian language become more like Russian? Would we lose the particular endings to our words? Or, or, or what's going to happen? And, and of course, there was no answer. There, there is no meaningful answer except Russian will take over. And that was not quite what you could say. Yeah. Um, so so um, yeah, it was a bit of a trap, wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> yeah. Tight rope for all concerned, I think, so at points. You've talked about the interface between, well, I think, individuals of these other states, non-Russian, mm -hmm. and the Soviet state, the Politburo. Mm -hmm. But what about the parliaments of these individuals? I'm, I'm not quite clear about the interface there. And after the Second World War, of course, the, the, the places like Hungary and, and, well, the whole Eastern Bloc, uh, as we used to call it. Um, what was the interface there in terms of between the individuals and the Russian, you know, they're, they're in the middle? Yeah, so <coughs> in terms of the Union Republics, the constituent republics of the Soviet Union, there was some semblance, but it was, I think in many ways symbolic more than anything of some notion of Republican level autonomy, a Republican level decision making. And even in the early years, right, like a, one of the big um, uh, things that was celebrated by the Soviet state was in the Kazakh Soviet Socialist Republic, governmental affairs can and should take place in the Kazakh language, right, and so on and so forth. But this was a highly centralized state all the same, right, like the budget comes from Moscow, the decision making is all placed in in Moscow. Well, there is certainly um, people on the ground who, who populate and staff the bureaucracies in the Republican level governments. They were always subsidiary to Moscow, right? And in the early years, there's another way in which the hierarchy plays out in the sense of, you know, you create an Uzbek Republic, but in Moscow, there's a, a, a conception or a conceit that you don't have qualified Uzbeks to staff that <laughs> Republican level government. So we should send out people from the center to help them build up their local, their local government. In terms of the post-war, um, the post-war socialist world, Soviet-led Soviet world, it's a somewhat different story because Czechoslovakia, right, Poland, Eastern Germany, they're nominally independent states, right? Certainly there's hierarchy, certainly there's subordination. 
but it, it plays out differently. It is also a book that should be written in this series um, in the sense that technically, right, those states are independent states and they're not incorporated and merged into the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. I don't, I hope that answers the, the question somewhat, but. Uh, yes, my main school is the Yeah. Uh, how it, if it was different, uh, it was obviously different, but um, in what way? Did, um, you have very strong governments, I mean, in, in Hungary, for instance. Uh, um, yeah, uh, well, <coughs> I think that's like beyond the scope of my, <laughs> my, of my expertise and the book, but I think I would be interested actually, this is something that I have not studied myself, I would be interested at how much the Soviet Union tried to like play the role of exporting their progressive ethnic politics and saying to the Hungarians, now you try this out for size or, um, but I, I, don't, I don't know how. No, but uh, not particularly, I, mean, I, I, I haven't, I can't pretend I studied studied the subject uh, deeply either, but I think in case of Hungary, especially after 1956, they were allowed to, uh, they were allowed a lot of leeway in how they did things generally, I mean, especially economically, having sort of suppressed the uprising with tanks, that was the stick, then came the carrot, and, and hence the standards of living in Hungary, for example, were one of the highest in the socialist bloc because they had small elements of market economy and they could sort of flirt with other local solutions. But in terms of exporting the Soviet model of nationalities, um, I, d I don't know. I mean, I, I suppose Czechoslovakia is uh, an interesting example of that. And, and again, you don't have uh, the first Slovak leader of the Czechoslovakian Communist Party comes in 1968, you know, as, as late as that, Dubček, right? Um, and, and to what extent the Soviets intervened into kind of local affairs, I, I, I'm not sure they did that much. Um, you know, I'm not sure they intervened too much in how the Hungarian majority treated, sorry, the, the Romanian majority treated the Hungarian minority in, in Romania, for example, and so on. Um, certainly they did not mess with Cuba and how, you know, the, <laughs> the, the, the kind of the racial and ethnic uh, inequalities played out there was never part of a bigger discussion or even criticism or, or anything like that. But in terms of the Soviet post-war uh, post um, relationship between the center in Moscow and, and the republics mm. and their corresponding, you know, kind of, uh, versions of Moscow authorities in the party, uh, each republic had its own communist party except one, Russia. Right? The Russians didn't need one, uh, <laughs> or so they said, because they've got the Soviet Communist Party. Um, but everyone had their own communist party, everyone had their own Soviet, Supreme Soviet and, and, and all those things. And um, after the war, republics even get their Ministry of Foreign Affairs each, which is quite strange if you think of it. But it, they, of course, have to toe the, the central line and, and can't really... Uh, deviate too much, but but sometimes you know mishaps happen, and, and someone might make a speech on behalf of the Republican Foreign Ministry, and then get you know wrapped um, for for going in the wrong direction or, or something. But they also were used because the Soviet Union, I think, on the international stage, and you touched on that with with the development projects yeah. uh, being kind of showcase of what Soviet anti-colonialism at home achieved, kind of thing. But also they. Um, used uh, you know, leaders of national republics and, and, and their foreign ministries, their diplomats, to pretend that they were independent and that they were making particular speeches or particular points on the international stage that really Moscow had instructed them to do. Um, and, and even you know, if you think about the suppression of the Prague Spring in Czechoslovakia in 1968, that the person who leads um, the Soviet, the Warsaw, packed troops, but really the Soviet tanks, is, is a former chief of Belarus, so the guy who mm. preceded Masharov. So uh, the local leaders could get involved into politics quite prominently in the Soviet Union, but within the tight framework of the overall policy. I found it very interesting the way you talked about the Russians supporting the um, former colonies, mm. uh, and this would have been particularly in Africa and other places, wouldn't it, and, and India too. 
And then you talked about um, Putin wanting to um, colonize, or, or, or I forget the, the term you used. Um, we've seen what's happened in Ukraine, but what about the other areas which were formerly part of the Soviet Union? Because Putin seems to want to recreate the borders, doesn't he, or, yeah. or many of them? No, uh, Natalia said earlier, uh, you know, one of the ironies is uh, Putin has done a great job for Ukrainian nation building. They didn't need him, but uh, he certainly has done that. I think he's also um, uh, done a great job for promoting a sense of urgency in terms of people's wanting to join NATO <laughs> and uh, NATO enlargement, right, and all of these. Th I think there are very good reasons for people to be nervous in the Baltic states. Um, I think Putin believes that he has a very, sp I mean, he's not doing a great job in the current war that he has um, on his hands, right? But I think that in terms of his worldview and his mission, right, he has said aloud and openly, right, the collapse of the Soviet Union, he said, was the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of, of the 20th, 20th century. and. Not, that's not just, right, like a sense of kind of Soviet loss or, or ambivalence, right? I think that he feels it's a historical crime that this great superpower and this great empire was collapsed, and in his mind too, right, there's a, a, an argument here, a logic, a vision of kind of Western interference, malign taking down of, of the Russian world and a wanting to put the Russian world back together. Um, Again, I think that they have good reason to be nervous precisely because he does sit in power in Moscow and he has this very imperialist, um, revanchist mission. I think in terms of will there be invasions tomorrow or the next day, unlikely because the current invasion he's trying to run is not a, such a smash up military success, right? Um, uh, but your other question about decolonization, it's not a huge focus of the book, but it's something that I find really fascinating in terms of thinking about the second half of the 20th century and thinking about the Cold War and kind of stories that historians are only probing and uncovering or putting more investment in now. And this is, right, the Soviet Union's engagement of these new nation states born of the era of decolonization after World War II, right, and inviting just thousands upon thousands of young students from new nations in Africa, in Asia, to come to Moscow, to learn the Soviet way, to be um, convinced or persuaded of an allegiance to the Soviet star and the Soviet example in terms of the, you know, the part of the Cold War that was a competition for allies and allegiance and also client states as well. I think that that is a story that historians have recently been doing a lot of incredible work about, but I think, I think it's a fascinating, a fascinating one, and it plays over and entangles with this one as well because many of the, the African students who came to the Soviet Union during the Cold War in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, they had kind of ambivalent experiences. On the one hand, they made friends, they learned Russian, they got um, degrees, some of them, technological expertise that they could and did bring back to their home countries. But they also experienced racism in a state that claimed that it was, we don't have race here, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have that here, like we're completely pure. But they, if that, if that were true, why am I being, you know, assaulted with, sometimes physical assault, but also kind of racial epithets on the bus or on the street or in the metro and all of these things. So I think that it, 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 it has, a, has a relevance to this story as well. But it's a, huge, it's a huge part of Cold War history that I think didn't get sufficient attention until recently and a fascinating one. So it's certainly an ongoing process, I think, that new work is coming out um, all the time. It's fascinating. But I wanted to come back to the question of Putin's well, reconstruction yeah, of the yeah. Soviet Union, I, I suppose, as you say, or recolonization. Um, and I guess that's my cue as a historian of Belarus. Yeah. Um, the, the one place where, um, unfortunately, he seems to have, well, 
in some ways succeeded mm -hmm. in reclaiming without a single shot being fired on that territory as Belarus. Um, and it, it is a country whose government, not the people, and I want to make that distinction very clear, but the government signed off the sovereignty to Russia. I mean, the minute they offered their territory as a launching pad for the full-on invasion of Ukraine uh, in 2022. And it continues to do so playing into uh, Putin's um, blackmail over nuclear weapons and, and, and Belarus, uh, changing its constitutional, um, uh, article of its constitution um, through a, a fake referendum uh, to allow, again, the stationing of nuclear warheads on its territory. So um, in a sense that, you know, the, the, this pattern, this very worrying pattern of wanting to reconstruct the Soviet Union through either blackmail or um, uh, war um, is, is, is emerging, unfortunately. And, and also, let's not forget the, the, the other side of, of Russia, if you like, in Central Asia. There's, there's also been a pattern of trying to bring in Kazakhstan, most notably, um, and uh, uh, some kind of a federation or, 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 or a union with, um, with Russia and um, Belarus um, less successfully, a lot less successfully than in Belarusian case because of the presence of China and Kazakhstan being a bit, quite a bit different from Belarus and so on. But the, those sort of um, impulses are there and, and, and they're not just about a full-on invasion, so they're more subtle and more kind of, uh, stealthy ways of, uh, of, of Russia trying to achieve that. Um, so it's, you know, again, it's a very pertinent question and, and, and very worrying. So um, you mentioned the ethnic policies of the Soviet Union being schizophrenic, I think was the word you used. <laughs> I think um, Natalia used yeah. it, but I will co-sign. <laughs> right. Uh, but one overarching theme was clearly, um, also in your words, the elevation of Russianness. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, how do you make sense of the fact that this, uh, in large part, I think, happened under a leader, under a decision maker who wasn't actually Slavic himself, right? Mm -hmm. um, he clearly wasn't Russian. He spoke with a accent. heavy accent, yeah. And um, he did change his name, but he wasn't ashamed of his ethnicity, I believe. No. He went through periods where he read Georgian history and literature. Um, but at the same time, yeah, he pursued this really aggressive ethnic um, politics, yeah. right, that promoted Russianness. Um, how do you sort of make sense of that? How does that make sense in his worldview? Yeah. Um, so, this is a great question, and we're talking about Stalin, of course, who did famously speak Russian. He was embarrassed of it, his, his heavily accented Russian, um, himself uh, Georgian and non-Russian. So it's a great question. How do we make sense of the fact that a non-Russian ends up kind of authorizing and setting into motion an add-on to this original ethnic politics, this Russia as the first among equals? Here, too, I think the geopolitical story is absolutely key. There, and it's not just Stalin, right? In the 1930s, the Soviet Union is facing a very real prospect of Hitler's armies invading Soviet territory. And there's actually a kind of sober pragmatism on the part of the Soviet leadership that would have been hard to imagine, right, in the heady days of like November or December of 1917. By which I mean, in the 1930s, they have come to the sober realization that they're not gonna convince average ordinary peasants all across the Soviet Union to give up their lives and to defend the Soviet Union by invoking the famous words of Karl Marx or Friedrich Engels. That an ordinary Soviet person is not gonna lay down their life for an ideology or a program. They need, right, something more motivating, more urgent, more visceral. And as they understand it, right, having a kind of proud history, a shared history, a nationalist feeling to help motivate people is what will be needed to get this multi-ethnic, 
in many ways overwhelmingly non-Russian population to lay down their lives for a multi-ethnic state that's pushing a Russo-centric patriotism. I, I talk about it as a kind of calculus of pragmatic patriotism, right? This is what we need to, this is what we'll need in order to get Soviet people to win this war if it comes to our borders as we hope that it will not. And it kind of follows a similar logic to what we were talking about before. Like once you go so hard in that direction, it's hard to walk it back. I don't think though that after the war, or any time after the war, any of the Soviet leaders did want to walk, walk it back because they actually saw the value, right? They, they actually said Russian history, Russian culture is so great, but under the Soviet umbrella, under this friendship of peoples, it's a Russian patrimony that belongs to us all. So if you're a Georgian, you can also delight and lay claim to this glorious Russian cultural past. If you're a gypsy, you can lay claim. If you're a Ukrainian, it's all of ours to share. And so again, it goes back to your earlier question, right? Like claiming two things at the same time um, and making it, making it work to the best of, of their advantage, both for all kinds of purposes, right? Um, we're all equals, we're happily multi-ethnic, yet there's one ethnicity that stands above us all. And in talking about the complexity of human lives, it worked for a lot. It meant, it meant, it meant a lot for ordinary people to lay claim to that patrimony, to lay claim to that Russian culture. Um, Brandon Schechter is a great historian who wrote this great book about the Red Army in World War II, and he paid a lot of attention to non-Russian experiences of fighting this war, like soldiers who don't even speak Russian fluently fighting in this war in which Russian language is the, the state language. And one of the things that he was able to chart in their memoirs and their, was this sense of gratitude for being let into Russian greatness being able to share into Russian greatness. So as odd as, or as strange, or as counterintuitive as it seems, right, there was this pragmatic impulse, and it seemed to reap a good amount of, of dividends, um, especially in the wartime experience. There is, of course, you know, the, your, your question also speaks to the larger question that I actually begin the book with, which is a kind of like, you know, like a, a kind of romp through some of the main revolutionaries in 1917. Overwhelmingly, they're not Russian, right? And that's kind of where I begin. They were people of an, a multi-ethnic empire who were trying to imagine a new way of organizing existence. And for them, right, ethnic difference was banal, a fact of life, but as such, something that they had to deal with that they had to learn to make work for the purposes of building and succeeding in their revolutionary agenda. I also wonder, and I, I'm, again, I'm not at all a specialist on Stalin, or for example, or, or a lot less um, than Bridget on Litvinovs <laughs> and such uh, <laughs> people, uh, but I, I do wonder, and it, it does seem to me from some of the early kind of discussions and conversations that they had with each other trying to hammer out this policy um, or this approach to different nationalities in the Soviet Empire uh, or, or former Russian Empire after the revolution, that there is a certain... Bridget, you're absolutely right. They're all, not all, but many of them, if not most of them, are non-Russian by origin. Um, and there is a certain sense of... Or for all the internationalism, they look up to the Russian culture and Russian literature and Russian music as this kind of European, modern, um, the best of it is, is, is the model to aspire to. And then, you know, that, that also uh, influences Stalin's embracing uh, socialist realism, for example, right? It's the best of Russian culture that we will take up as a, a model for Soviet culture to follow, but with the more socialist content to it. Um, and, and, the, and there is a certain sense of um, trying to be almost more Russian than if they were actually Russian to some extent. Now I, what comes to mind is this 
uh, incident in, in the Caucasus, when Lin is still alive, um, that happens over the nationality policy when, when the Georgian communists on the ground are pushing a little too hard for people like Ojonikidze and Stalin, who's at that point the um, nationalities commissar of the, of the Soviet state. And they're pushing so hard that actually a fight breaks out between Orchard Kids and someone else um, in, in Georgia. And Lenin is really furious and he, he, he accuses those people who are supposed to represent the Soviet nationality policy and be sensitive to ethnic groups as uh, becoming more Russian than if they were actually Russian by, by birth. And he's very cross and he thinks that we, we, we really need to get this balance right and we really need to err on the side of non-Russian uh, nationalism rather than the side of Russian chauvinism. But unfortunately at this point uh, he's too ill and you know soon is incapacitated to take this any further. But there's writing, you know, his memos that, that are left. Um, and and, and you I do wonder, you know, to what extent the fact that Stalin continued to speak Russian with a heavy accent made him, you know, go over the the top and embracing Russianness. So he wanted to be, you know, like the queen, whiter than white. So it, it is just a you know a question to, to think of. In sum, right, and I don't even mean this to be glib, I mean this to be very serious, like the paradoxes abound. There are internationalists who promote nationalism in the name of internationalism. There are avowed anti-colonialist, anti-imperialists who are also Eurocentric, <laughs> right, aggressively Eurocentric. Um, they are kind of, they do something that is unheard of anywhere else in the world and kind of launching this anti-racist campaign globally, yet at the same time they sponsor and reproduce their own types of racism, right? Like, there are so many ways in which the ironies and the paradoxes kind of play, like you, you, you know, I was talking about the waves and the tightrope, but you also mentioned the kind of like, the, the looping too, right? The looping in terms of the paradoxes that, that work throughout the story too. Thank you, Natalia and Bridget. Um, I think we are out of time, uh, but thank you so much. That's been very fascinating. And yeah, please join me in thanking Bridget and Natalia. <laughs>just to, to say that we, we, we still we are open for another 15 minutes so if you want to have one final drink and we still have some copies left so please buy them from us and I'm sure Bridget will be happy to sign them if you know um, that is something that uh,